if our families have any hope, people must know Jesus. This is what we must experience. The time is coming on this earth where you will have to stand. Days of our probation are fast closing. The end is near. To us, the warning is given. Take heed to yourself. Father in heaven, we pray for the Holy Spirit to come into this room and to bless us from your word. We're so sorry, Lord, as we look at ourselves and recognize that you have chosen a man to deliver such serious words, such sacred words. Tonight, I pray that you would help me to surrender. I pray that my heart and my mind would be exchanged for the heart, the new heart that you give us in the mind of Christ. Please bind every unclean spirit and help us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Good evening. It's good to be back. If you would turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 1. Revelation, chapter 1. We're going to begin dealing with some prophecies from the book of Revelation, but tonight I want to lay a foundation. And by the way, for those of you who came Saturday night, I apologize for you only getting testimonies. You should have got a serious message from the Lord. Um, I, it had come to my attention that one of my members was very sick unto death, so I left to go and pray with that particular member. And I had instructed someone to preach, but I don't know what happened. But please forgive me for dropping that ball. I would have come back if, if I would have known that. The Bible says in the book of Revelation, chapter 1. First of all, the book of Revelation is probably one of the most hated books in the Bible. When you study the various passages that are found in the book of Revelation, you find that there's no other book written in the Bible that quotes more, more books of the Bible than the book of Revelation. Now, a lot of people say that the book of Revelation can not be un understood. But the word itself means unveiling. Unveiling or to lay bare or to make naked. Now, God would not name a book such clear names if it was supposed to be a secret. God intended for us to be able to understand this particular book, and he wrote it in symbols, not so that his children could not understand it, but so that people who would understand it would be lovers of the Word of God. So first of all, it says it unveils. And then it says it lays bare. And then it says it makes naked. In other words, it makes something so crystal clear that there is no possibility of deception. 
Why is it then that so many people don't understand it? And what is it that is being unveiled? Or what is being laid bare? Or what is being made naked or so clear that no one can deny it? The Bible says very clearly that this particular book is presenting none other than Jesus Christ himself in a form and in a matter that people will be drawn to serve him. As a matter of fact, when we start dealing with these prophecies beginning tonight and going through the next few weeks, you're going to find that the Muslim has to give up or surrender his beliefs if he ever learns the secrets of the book of Revelation. The Hindu has no promises to stand on. The Buddhist is just outdone. The book of Revelation, without it, we could not truly support the validity of the Word of God itself unless God worked a supernatural miracle. Now, there's another book that goes hand in hand with it, but I will introduce that as we go forward. Let's notice what the Bible says in Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. Heavenly Father, we pray again for the precious promise of the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. We pray that the Holy Spirit would breathe so heavily upon us that this unveiling can become a reality in our minds tonight. Unveil your truth. Lay it bare before us. Let us see, in Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says the revelation of who? Of Jesus Christ. So the whole book of Revelation is a culmination of a revealing of Jesus Christ. So it says the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must what? Shortly come to pass, and he sent it and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Now that's the second problem that we face. And this is why so many people say that the book of Revelation is a secret. It can't be understood because it was not written for everybody. No other book in the Bible is there an exclusiveness as with the book of Revelation. And God begins showing that there are favored people who this book was written for, a specific people, and everybody who embraces Christianity is not truly welcome to this particular book because this particular book is only given to those who are truly servants of God. Do you believe the Bible? Do you believe what it really says? Well, that's clearly what it says. He begins by saying everybody shouldn't try to study it. Everybody need not read it, for it was specifically given to reveal Christ only to those who were truly servants of God. Let's read that again, lest you say that I be found a liar. The Bible says the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto who? To who? Not everybody, his servants. So it really becomes a matter of a waste of time for those to start studying the revelations of Christ and even learning the symbols of Christ if they are not truly servants of Christ. Now, what is a servant? What is a servant? I think we should start, and I want to walk through this and simplify it. And let me tell you, brothers and sisters, the bottom line is, not the first couple of chapters. They're very important, and they're extremely good object lessons in them, and they're important historical facts in them, but the bottom line is Revelation brings us to where we are right now. Next week, or maybe even this week, we're going to come to a point where you're going to see so clearly America and its role in prophecy and in these end times. You're going to see so clearly what role Italy will play, and Europe, what role the whole world will play. You're going to see what the Christian church is going to push and what they're already implementing. You will see very clearly that George Bush's biggest problem is not Iraq. 
His biggest problem is the deceptive powers of Satan that have blinded him from the truth and caused him to start fulfilling prophecy. Do you know that we have not had any other president that has fulfilled more prophecies than George W. Bush? And he doesn't know it. He has no idea. And President Bill Clinton was no better. He pushed the envelope as far as he possibly could. And prior to him, George Bush Sr. even announced it in one of his State of the Union addresses. He said, it is a, it is a big idea, a new world order. When they see it, they don't really understand it. Because they are only embracing it from an economic standpoint. They're only embracing it from a human safety standpoint. They are embracing it from a standpoint that will secure their wealth, their riches, and their children to come. The Bible says that when they shall cry peace and safety, sudden destruction is going to come upon this earth. Let's look at that a moment. Go with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Listen, brothers and sisters, as we begin studying this book, you need to surrender your heart like never before. Satanic devices and assaults will come upon you like never before because God knows that if you ever see the naked truth, if you ever see how clear the coming of the Lord is and how clear His promises are that you will never be the same and you cannot keep it to yourself, it will literally become the light that God says He wants to shine out of you. And so the enemy will do anything to shut this out, anything to keep you from studying it. And so, brothers and sisters, I beg you to pray. I beg you to ask God, to show you yourself and deliver you from sin so that you could truly be a servant and not only understand, because it's not the intellectual understanding, it's the understanding that will cause you to live the principles that will be revealed. The Bible says, but of the times and the seasons, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, if you're there, let me hear you say amen. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as what? A thief in the night. Now God, God says this is the, the, the day of God is not coming as a thief to the true servants of God. It's coming as a thief to those who are not watching and waiting for the coming of the Lord. For notice what it goes on to say very clearly. The Bible says, for when they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction come up, cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, when, uh, and, and, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as what? A thief. Ye are children of, the, of light, and children, uh, and not of children of the, excuse me, Heavenly Father, I plead and beg for you to take control of my tongue. I pray, dear God, that you would loose my mind and with your authority speak your words. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The Bible says, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be what? Sober, clearly awake, clear minds. Jesus is about to come. Prior to his coming, he started unveiling these prophecies and making them clear to those who would live in the end time. For the Bible says very clearly in Revelation chapter 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants. What is a servant? A servant, a servant is one who gives his will over to another. That's what a servant is. A servant is one who gives his will over to another. 
Now, a Christian servant is one who gives himself and his will over to Christ and over to the will of God, disregarding even his own self. In other words, you literally get to a point where your whole duty and your whole mind and your whole object is to serve God with such intensity that you forget all about yourself. Where God has to remind you, hey, you need to eat. That's how Martin Luther was, the great reformer Martin Luther. He would study and pray with such an intensity that he would start crying when it was time to go and eat because he didn't want to leave the Bible. But an angel would come and touch him and remind him, Martin, you're only a human. You must go and you must eat. You must get some nutrition. Well, a true servant of God, he devotes himself with such an intensity where he forgets about himself. His money is spent on the cause of God. His time is spent on the cause of God. Everything about him is trying to fulfill the will of God. And what is the will of God? That we might know Jesus that the world might know him, that the world might surrender to him, that we would yield ourselves to him. Now the Bible is very clear in Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. The Bible is very clear. A very strong passage. In Romans 6, the Bible talks about this servanthood. A servant is one who gives his will over to another. We're talking about a servant. And I think it's important that we deal with this for a moment because, brothers and sisters, if you are not a servant of God, if you are not truly surrendered to God, then why try to learn? Why get an intellectual knowledge where it only crushes you in the judgment? The Bible says in Romans chapter 6, if you're there, let me hear you say amen. In Romans 6, beginning with verse 16, the Bible says, Know ye not? that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. Now here the Bible is pretty clear. The Bible draws a line. God says that you're going to serve somebody. God makes a line. And the Bible says that whichever one we choose... And when you look at this particular word where it says, um, 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 know ye not to whom ye yield, that word yield means to take a stand or to stand by. To stand by in the original language. So when it says, whoever you take your stand by, but what it gives a picture of in the original language, it refers you back to the situation that was taking place in Exodus chapter 32. Notice what it says in Exodus 32. Exodus, what chapter are we going to? Heavenly Father, I thank you for the Holy Spirit. But breathe on us even heavily, even more heavily. In Jesus' name, amen. You see, brothers and sisters, this unveiling of Christ, this laying bare of Christ, is given to his servants in the end time, to give them a strength and a fortitude to press through the time of trouble that shall and will come upon this earth. We haven't seen anything yet. You can go back and you can do a, you, and you can get all the different files of the old newspapers and the news reels and the news articles on all the calamities that have hit this earth. But brothers and sisters, you haven't seen anything yet. The Bible says in, Ro in Revelation chapter 7 verse 1 that there are angels, one that is commissioned to stand at the east, one to the west, one to the north, and one to the south, and they protect demonic forces from having complete authority over this earth. Just four angels. Hold all of them in check. They could go so far and no further. And by the way, as far as they go with you is as far as you allow them to go. Satan, the Bible says, shall not have dominion over you. You have to give them permission to have the authority that they do have. 
They can do nothing without your permission, but the time will come. And it almost came where God said, loose the winds. And Revelation 7 says it wasn't quite time that God saw that there were a few more people that would become his servants if, if probation was lifted. And so the Bible says that in Revelation chapter 7 that, that an angel cried, hold, hold, hold the winds. Don't let the enemy have complete authority yet. But when he gets that authority, can you imagine what it's going to be like? Can you imagine? Brothers and sisters, we haven't had an earthquake in a while. That's those angels holding that wind. All the projected hurricanes that should have taken place this year, angels held the winds. These newscasters and these, these meteorologists, they can tell what's going to happen. They're wise enough with their technology. The only thing they cannot project is what God will allow to go through and what he will stop. But when they said that, that, that Florida should have seen at least six to eight hurricanes this year, they projected the truth. They're even baffled. They can't understand why. Because all their studies and all evidence pointed to, to, to Florida getting hit real hard. But God said to the angels, hold but he's not always going to hold it he's not always going to hold it brothers and sisters this earth is going to shake with trouble trouble that we have never seen before death is going to be so rapid and so fast that we're not going to be able to bury the people fast enough God is trying to get us ready he's not trying to frighten us he doesn't want us to be scared it's got to come. It must happen. Why must it happen? Because some of us are going to get so close to God. Some of us are going to surrender everything we have to God. But God has to allow certain things to take place where we get to the point where not only is our sinfulness wiped out, but our earthly desires are gone too. What do I mean? In other words, where we get to the point where it's nothing here that we desire at all. We just want to go home. And our prayers are centered toward going home. And our mind is on going home. And our talk is about going home. And no matter what fashion comes out or what car comes out or what new home or what new furniture or what new restaurant, we just want to go home. We just want to go home. Do you know that Christ lived that way all of his life? Jesus never found anything that made him comfortable on this earth. Every day of his life, at some point, he wept because he wanted to go home. The Bible says strong tears in Hebrews chapter 10. And you know when I read that, brothers and sisters, I remember one day reading that. It almost just caught me now. Lord, thank you. Please pour out your spirit. Please be with us, Lord, as we lay this important foundation. We beg you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. I'll never forget when I read that one night. Go with me a moment. We'll come right back to Exodus. Just look at this a minute with me. Hebrews chapter 10. I remember reading this about my Savior. See, Jesus is a personal friend of mine. The only problem that we have is that I am not as faithful to him as a friend as he is to me. The Bible says in, in the book of Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. The Bible says, beginning with verse 9, Hebrews, what chapter are we in? 10, beginning with verse 9. The Bible says, Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. That's not the verse I'm looking for. I want to find it. Well, let me just say it. It's where he said, that when he was here on earth, he would find himself in prayer with strong tears. And I'll tell you what it means, and the text will come to me as we go. When I read that, I stopped a minute, and I thought about him. And I started thinking about how nobody understood Christ when he was on this earth. He lived the loneliest human life life that ever existed nobody ever understood 
or even came close to understanding. And the worst thing about it was, with all that he did, nobody even really tried to understand him. Everybody who he was around was absorbed so much in themselves that they never, ever could sympathize or empathize or bring human comfort to him. When the Bible says he came unto his own in John chapter 1 verse 11 and his own received him not, it spoke of every Jew that was alive. It spoke of Bartholomew and Andrew and Peter and John and James and Judas and all the rest of the disciples, his mother, none of them received him. That word means really embraced him and tried to get to know who he was. And when I thought about that, how he would spend long nights in prayer crying because he wanted to go home. And do you know that every single night that Jesus prayed and the deep yearnings for home came upon him, the only thing that caused him to stay was me, you, he knew that if he had left, nobody, no fallen being would have ever questioned him if he had gone home. He didn't come here to prove anything. He came here to save us. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, he came into the world to prove that he could defeat the devil. It says he came so that he could save us from sin. He came so that we could one day not be servants of Christ, but be joint heirs with Christ. In heaven, he won't even let us take the title of servants. In heaven, we rise to a level, brothers and sisters, of unfallen angels, and we take a role in heaven more superior than the role that they now have. With tears. And so it gives us a, a clear understanding as to why God must be serious about who he takes. About who he takes. God is only taking those who are children of the day, children of light. Darkness belongs to Satan. The very first creative act that God did when he came to this earth was to separate light from darkness. That was the first thing he did. In the beginning, God. And God said, let there be light. And he separated the light from the darkness. That was the first thing he did. Because no darkness. And have you ever noticed that demons love to dwell in dark places? They love it. Think about it. What theater is well lit? What concert hall? When you go to watch a concert, uh, 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 some hip-hop concert or some rock and roll concert, it's always dark. Satan loves to dwell in darkness. More crime takes place at night than in the day. Jesus only stuck around for you and me. And so when the Bible says, know ye not to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, it means who you stand by. In other words, God is saying very clearly, brothers and sisters, tonight that there's a line. There's a line that is drawn. And the line is extremely clear. The line is extremely clear. And you can never, ever be on both sides. Either you yield and you stand on God's side, or you stand on the side of Satan. You can never, ever be. Your thoughts are never controlled by both powers. Tonight, even now, everyone in this room either completely belongs to God, or they completely belong to Satan. And so when God says, whoever you yield yourselves to, Whoever you give your will over to, 
And the devil loves people who profess to be Christians who go home and just sit in front of the television and watch a bunch of garbage. He loves that because it confuses everybody around to what Christianity really is. He loves people who profess to be Christians that don't spend time in prayer. He loves people who profess to be Christians who gossip and tear down and who spend their money on just anything carelessly and they don't give God what is his. So when God says who you yield to, it says the, the original paints a picture of taking a stand next to somebody. It paints a picture of two centurions, two great soldiers, two generals standing, and they're both yay high, and they both look powerful, and you really can't see which one has the grand authority. But by the word you can tell that one denotes light and the other denotes darkness. And you have to stand on one of those sides. Exodus 32 is pictured when you look at the commentators' comments on that particular text. Notice what it says in Exodus chapter 32. And if you're there, let me hear you say amen. In Exodus chapter 32, the Bible says very clearly, beginning with verse 26, Exodus 32, beginning with verse 26, The Bible says, as a matter of fact, you know the picture. Moses had been up with God. He had been so much in prayer with God that he lost sight of everything. God told Moses, Moses, get up. Get you down. My people are acting a fool. The children of Israel had stopped worshiping God long before Moses went up the mountain. You see, they were so deeply entrenched in human worship and idol worship that when Moses wasn't around, even though the cloud that God would have a fire by night and a cloud by day, even though the cloud was still there, the children of Israel, when they didn't see a human instructor, forgot that God was still watching. And they told Aaron, they said, Aaron, build us an idol. Build us an idol, an idol like the idol we worshipped in Egypt. Now, you know, it's a whole lot in that, brothers and sisters, because when, when we surrender to God and we give our hearts to God, the things of the world, which is a symbol of Egypt, should not be a part of our diets anymore. He said, build us an idol, please. And Aaron was a weak preacher. He was a weak pastor like the majority of pastors today. They just build whatever the people want, and they tell the people whatever they want to hear. And they do anything to keep the people happy. And before you know it, the children of Israel started dancing and shouting around that calf. And brothers and sisters, I don't know if you've noticed or not, but God's true worship doesn't need a whole lot of noise. God's true worship doesn't need a whole lot of dancing. We should be able to look at the worship of God from afar off, and the same way we can tell a goat from a lamb, we should be able to tell the true worship of God. It should be very, very clear. Now, you have been around long enough to know that's changed, haven't it? That's changed greatly, hasn't it? People are doing everything now in the name of the Lord, aren't they? But if you ever want to know what is true Christian music, all you have to do is look at the newspaper the day after the Grammy Awards. Look at the newspaper. Whitney Houston sung a song, Hold Up the Light. And that song was so powerful <clears throat> that they said, we're going to give her a Grammy Award. But they gave her a Grammy Award in rock and roll, R&B, rhythm and blues. And Whitney Houston wrote, wrote the Grammys and, and wrote them and, and said, no, I won't receive this. This is a godly song. This is a gospel song. And they wrote her back and said, look, you could call it what you want, but we are the authorities in music, and that's no gospel. That's rhythm and blues that we hear. Just because you put Jesus' name in it doesn't make it holy. 
Just because it makes you feel good. Cocaine will make you feel good. Fornication will make you feel good. We don't go by feeling. We go by principles as Christians. And often it won't feel good when you take a stand for God. Moses comes off the mountain. He's up here praying. The children of Israel are dancing and acting a fool. And if you look through the Bible, every time you saw professed Christians or the Israelites in apostasy, they were dancing and singing like the world. That's something to think about, isn't it? Something to think about. How on earth can these popular gospel singers be on the same charts and be played in the same halls as those who are professing ungodliness. No wonder they just had the first hip-hop awards in the history of hip-hop. The first hip-hop awards about a month ago or two weeks ago. And, 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 and hip-hop artists after hip-hop artists got up and first thanked God. Because they're looking at these gospel singers who are singing the same type of of music and they're gyrating their bodies in the same fashion and they're hanging out at the same places of entertainment and they're wearing the same types of jewels and they're saying the or, or bling whatever you want to call it and they're, and, and, and they're talking the same talk and so they say well God accepts us too but God says there's a line and that line has to be clear it has to be crystal clear and it doesn't matter what you like. It isn't about what I like. You think I don't like rhythm and blues? You think I don't enjoy some jazz? Somebody said, what's wrong with jazz? Jazz was not originated in heaven for the elevating and the uplifting of Jesus Christ our Savior. Jazz was derived from the dark palaces of hell and it came through voodoo music into the halls of America and into the chambers of many of our homes. And because it makes us feel good, the devil understands what chords will cause you to have emotions. The Bible says that he had perfect chords when he was created. Ezekiel 28 says that his vocal chords were perfect. And many of us, brothers and sisters, the problem that we have is that we believe that we could be on both sides or that we could carry some of Satan's things with us onto this side. And if we have enough of God's stuff, it's okay to have a little bit of Satan's. But brothers and sisters, I need to tell you something. The Bible says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, he shall also reap. So if you're sowing anything that belongs to the devil, your tree is going to come up looking like the devil. God is looking for a people, a true people, to unveil himself to. He's looking for a people who will stand on his side. And the stand that they take, the stand alone will be so clear to the world that they dress different, they look different, they speak different. Everything about these people are different. And God will be able to then use you to point to Jesus and show people who he really is. But our problem is, the majority of us, even in this room, spend most of our time on Satan's side thinking that we're on God's side. Or deceived into believing that God is going to work some miracle to save you. The miracle was that God himself took on the form of a human and walked on this earth and was tempted in every single point just as you were. And he didn't sin. If that wasn't good enough or isn't good enough, then nothing else God could do is, brothers and sisters. He's not going to come and orchestrate something that will force you to yield. You have to yield by choice. And it's a constant choosing. And so Jesus says that the revelation of himself the unveiling, the laying bare, if you want to see the naked truth, 
God in his purity, he says it's found in that book. He says the revelation of the revealing of Jesus Christ that God gave unto his son to show only to those who are really yielding to him, who are really servants. And to be a servant means to stand by. And it takes us back to when, when Moses was up on the mountain and he's praying and he's pleading and he's, ag- and he's agonizing with God. And in agony, God disturbs their communication. And he says, Moses, get up. Hurry up. Get up, Moses. Get down there. Get down there to the people before I destroy them. And Moses got up immediately. And he started walking down. And he had the Ten Commandments in his hand. He had one in one arm and the other in the other. Moses was a strong man. And he started hiking down the hill, and Joshua was with him. And as they got closer to the crowd, Joshua said, what is that that I hear? And he said, it sounds sounds, sounds as though a war is going on down there. And Moses said, no, it's not a war. That's music and dancing. That's the sound of paganistic worship in a Christian church. That's what it is. Don't let them fool you. Come on. And when Moses got down there, Moses became so filled with righteous indignation and anger. In other words, anger that didn't stem from any personal issue that he had. He wasn't mad about anything they were doing to him. He was angry about what was being done to God. And that's why he cast those two stables of stones down. Immediately after he rebuked them. Notice what the Bible says. Notice what it says. (laughs) And you can read the whole chapter of, of, of Exodus 32 when you go home. But notice what it says. In verse 15 it says, And Moses turned and, and, and went down from the mount. And the two tables of testimonies were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides. In other words, when God wrote the Ten Commandments in the stone with his finger, the fire burnt it where where, where if you turned it this way, it was there. If you turned it the other way, it was there. It was transparent. And it was written in the stone because the stone was a granite rock which represented Jesus himself. And now all of a sudden, it says, as Moses turned and went down from the mount, and, w- and the two tables of testimonies were in his hand, and the tables were written on both their sides, and on the one side and on the other were they written, and the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, graven upon the tables. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people, as they shouted, he said unto Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, it is not the voice of of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. And it came to pass as soon as he came nigh unto the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hand and brake them beneath the mount, and he took the calf which they made, which they had made, and, and, and burnt it in the fire, and ground it to powder, and strawed it upon the water, and made the children of Israel drink of it. And Moses said unto Aaron, What did this people unto thee that thou hast brought so great sin upon them. And Aaron said, not, let, not thy anger, uh, 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 not, let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. Thou knowest the people that they are set on, on, on mischief. For they said unto me, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us out of the land of Egypt, we want not what is become of him. We don't know where he went. And I said unto them, whosoever hath any gold, Let them break it off. He compromised. And then all of a sudden, the Bible says in verse 25, and when Moses saw that the people were naked, have mercy. Does that not sound the way that churches are today? Many churches are dancing and shouting and rocking, and when you look at the people, they're naked. They're naked. Women come into church with skirts, the length of my jacket. Every step they walk, they have to pull it. Nobody saying anything about it. Lord, have mercy. And all of a sudden, Moses 
heard the voice of God and he spoke clearly. And notice what he said. Listen to what he said. In verse 26 it said, Then Moses stood in the gate and, uh, uh, of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Who's going to stand by God? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword uh, by his side, and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man who? His brother? In other words, he said, Hey, listen, who's on the Lord's side? And they stepped over. The children of Levi. Levi means, in the Hebrew, the word Levi means joined. Joined to. Joined to. The Levites, they came from the lineage of Leah. Now watch this, brothers and sisters. Why is Leah so important? Leah was that sister that married Jacob. You remember when Jacob wanted to marry Rachel so bad? And he was so in love with Rachel, and he worked seven years to, to, to marry Rachel. And, and, and back then, when the women would get married, they'd be all clothed and all draped, and you wouldn't see them. And, and he said, I do, and went into the tent and, and woke up and found out it was Leah, the cross-eyed sister. Now, isn't it interesting that the third son of Leah was Levi. And it didn't matter how much Jacob loved Rachel. Didn't matter how beautiful Rachel was. God did not bring the priestly nation out of a marriage that he never condoned. Leah also was the mother of Judah who was the great, 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 great grandfather or the progenitor of Christ. You see, no matter how far we get into sin, that's why I'm stopping here. No matter how far we dig into it and we start trying to make it right, you see, some of us tonight have sins that we have never made right, but because they're so far ago, because they've been done years ago, and we haven't made those things right. We think that God's going to want somehow overlook them. No, God says we need to examine our hearts. And the older you get, the more examining you need to do. Because unconfessed sin is unforgiven sin. And God is not going to accept anything that does not come, uh, come after the order of righteousness. Leah's children. She may not have been a beautiful woman, but it was something about her blood that produced children that God could trust in ministry. And the Levites immediately, when they were called, when Moses said, who's on the Lord's side? Listen, brothers and sisters. We're talking about servants. We're talking about those who this great book of Revelation was, was unveiled or written for. We're, we're, we're trying to see tonight who is really going to get it when we start going into this prophetic word. These preachers talk about they have a prophecy for you and a prophetic word for you. I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you from this book that many of them are nothing but sophisticated, oratorical, ski, oratorically skilled liars. And many of them don't even know it. I don't even know it. But the prophecies that you're going to get are only coming for the servants. If you're not really going to yield to God, if you're not going to serve, if you're not going to stand on his side, and what did it mean to take that side? Moses said, who's on the Lord's side? Stand over here. And all the Levites stood over there. And immediately he said, okay, now we're going to see how much you really love God. Get your swords out. And I want you to go kill your own family that are not serving God. You see, nobody can clean up your house the way you can clean it up. You see, you don't know what I live like at home. And I don't know what you live like at home. But your brother knows how you live in that house. And your wife knows how you live. And your, your husband knows how you live. And the children know. So he said, you go throughout your own house and kill your brothers. And the Bible says over 3,000 were killed. But that wasn't enough. 
even though those who were in rebellion were wiped out, Moses ran back up that hill to talk to God, to plead with God. And notice what happens here. Notice what happens. This story just gets good. I'm going to let you go in a minute. Notice what the Bible goes on to say. The Bible says very clearly, beginning with verse 30, And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye have sinned a great sin. Notice. Moses didn't say, we have sinned. And normally when you follow the prayers of the prophets, the prophets always include themselves with the people. But Moses understood that this sin was so great that if he had connected himself with it, he could not have gone before God. Moses had just spent 40 days in the presence of God. Moses had lived on that mountain for 40 days. If Moses would have had any sin anywhere near him, he would have been consumed instantly. And so Moses goes up that hill. And Moses goes up that hill, and before he goes, he looks at them, and he says, hey, you have sinned against God. He didn't play with them. And we should stop playing with sin and playing with people. He says, you have sinned against God. And he said, and, and now I will go up unto the Lord peradventure. I shall make an atonement for your sin. In other words, I'm going up before God, but I know God so well that this time he might not let you off the hook. Peradventure. In other words, if he does listen to me, you better be glad because he might not. What you have done today deserves death. You have professed to be gods, but you have become servants of sin. You not only fell into sin, but you took the time to build an idol and call it a god. You took the time to start worshiping, saying, oh, that Moses with all that God has done for you. I'm going up here, and I'm going to intercede for you. I'm going to plead for you. But peradventure, and notice what the Bible says. Notice what it says. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou will forgive their sin, and if you look in your Bible, there's a line after the word sin. If there's a line there, can I hear you say amen? That line means that Moses stopped praying. If you look up in the, in the original language, that line means meditative act. In other words, he said, Lord, your people have sinned. I'm not playing any games in this confession. You see, some of us are playing games when we confess. Some of us are playing games when we confess. Some of us are playing games when we confess. We are not being real and open with God. And the Holy Spirit brings things to our minds that are offensive and against God. And rather than us dealing with it, we try to brush it off. Moses said, Lord, they have sinned, and this is specifically what they've done. And then he said, Lord, if. And then that line means he stopped and meditated because he knew that his next words if they weren't real, he would have died himself. Now follow me now. Now I need the couple to stop talking. I need you to hear this. Listen. There comes a time. Heavenly Father, I pray that as I start closing this out, that you would stop people from talking back and forth. Please pour out your spirit in this room. For truly, dear God, there is no voice that is important except the one that you have designated as your preacher. Please pour out your spirit. Please have mercy on us. The children of Israel had literally at that point cross the line the children of Israel had committed the impardonable sin the only thing that saved them was the friendship that Moses had with God God was ready to wipe them out they could not pray anymore themselves and get a prayer through 
Are you following me? They had gone so far. Now look, you have to understand something. 3,000 had been killed. I'm talking about servants tonight. You see, when we start saying we belong to God, we're God's chosen, we belong to God, and we keep tampering with sin, the time will come where you will be caught up in worship, and it will be too late, and it may not be a Moses around. Because the majority of people who are living in sin closely associate with other sinners, not people of righteousness. When I used to get high, I never would go and pick up people to go out with me that didn't want to smoke some weed with me. And I had friends that smoked weed, but if I wanted to smoke some sherm, I didn't go pick up my boys that smoked weed. I, I went and got somebody who wanted to smoke sherm with me. If I wanted to hit the pipe, I didn't go get some. I, see, people, so, like draws like. Moses was not a man of the crowd. He was a man of God. And if you are to be a woman of God or a man of God, you must separate from the crowd. You must become lonely when it comes to human compassion and overjoyed when it comes to heavenly compassion, heavenly companionship. Moses went up that hill. Moses had been in the face of God for 40 days. He knew that what they had done deserved every one of them being wiped out. 3,000 of the worst had already been killed, and it was still too late for everybody else. And so Moses goes up the hill, and, and, and he, says, he, says, he says, Lord, we've sinned. It's a great sin. I understand it. And, 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 and if you will forgive their sin. And he stops and he meditates. And then he says, if not, if you won't forgive them, Blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. God put his, Moses put his life on the line. He said, Lord, and he thought about it. That meditative act kicked in. He said, if not, he thought it through. And he said, no matter how sinful they are, they're my people. And Lord, I'm willing to die for them. How did he get to that point? where he had a true godly love for people. It was by staying in the presence of God himself. If you had asked Moses that would he do that, Moses would have said no. Moses didn't realize that by beholding God, he had become changed. He had become so much like God that he was willing to live a life that would end on earth and forfeit eternity if God would not give the people a little more chance. And that moved God. God said, Lord, have mercy. It moved the heart of God. Listen to what it says. Listen to what it says. I'm closing now. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Therefore now go lead the people unto the place which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, mine angel shall go before thee. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. And the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf which Aaron made. God said, I'm not going to wipe them all out because you just prayed, Moses. I won't do it. But I'm going to let them suffer for their own sin. You're my friend. I love you. I'm not going to blot you out. That's why when Moses died and angels buried Moses and the children of Israel searched for 30 days all through the mountains where he would normally be and they couldn't find him because if they would have found the body of Moses, they would have worshipped his bones. They would have prayed over him. They would have carried him like an altar. So God had to hide his body. But even then, the book of Jude says that God came a short time afterwards and resurrected Moses. Now the Bible says that the living know that they should die, but the dead know not anything. So in other words, Moses didn't realize that he was dead. He was asleep. He didn't miss God. But God missed Moses. 
God had built such a, uh, Moses had built such a personal relationship with God that in his death, Jesus missed his voice and longed to talk to his friend and went down himself and resurrected Moses and took him to heaven. And that's why we see Moses in Mark chapter 9 coming down with Elijah to strengthen his friend Jesus just before Jesus went to Calvary. We can have that type of relationship. What I'm talking about tonight is servanthood. I'm talking about servanthood. Tonight, before we go any further, are you a servant of God? The revelation that is about Christ that God gave to show his servants. He's talking about people like Moses. People who are really going to be serious about him. People who are going to leave everything behind and give their full, entire devotion. Let me give you one more text before we go. Luke 14. Oh yes, we're beginning a journey tonight. And see, let me, <clears throat> you know, brothers and sisters, the enemy is the enemy is something. When we enter into these type of warfares, we have to be very careful. We have to be very careful. We have to be very careful. I'm telling you, you are going to experience something you've never experienced before but you will only receive it. Beginning tonight, a separation's coming. Now, I won't know. I won't know which side anybody <clears throat> in the room stands on, but it's a separation that's going to come because beginning tonight, <clears throat> the truths that you are about to learn are going to make you have to make an immediate choice an immediate decision. There's, no, there's not going to be any time to vacillate. No time for you to stop and consider. When God says move, you're going to have to move. You see, the hour in which we are living according to the Bible in Romans chapter 13 the Bible says, beginning with verse 11, and that knowing the time, that now it is high time. In other words, you've already run late. You've already let too much time slip. And so when Paul says in Romans chapter 8, and by the way, that's Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10 that we were looking for earlier tonight. But when the, when the, when the Bible says... When the Bible says, and that knowing the time, that now it is high time. In other words, you're behind time. It's almost too late. Hurry up. Get on board. Grab hold. Jump. Grab. Pull yourself on. It's high time to awake out of sleep. For now, the Bible says, our salvation is nearer than when we believed. In other words, when you first heard the name Jesus. And now, it's almost too late. We have played with time. And God says very clearly that the book of Revelation that we're about to start studying is only written for those who are servants of the living God. And Paul said that there are servants of Satan and there are servants of God. And how do we know which one? Jesus says in Matthew and John 10, 27, My sheep hear my voice and I know them because they follow me. They don't hesitate. The minute God speaks, they follow. Any hesitation any point where you stop to think you could be wiped out 
a sniper is, turn, is, is trained to immediately take the shot. The minute he zero in, zeroes in on the shot, right then, boom, he has to take it. Any hesitation, he can miss the mark. There's no time to hesitate tonight. There's no time. Tonight, God is drawing a final line. A final line. And you know, it's fair because everyone in this room, if you are not completely joined to Christ, if you have not completely yielded or surrendered to God, you know right now what it is that you have not given up. But then some of us are beyond that because God has shown us so clearly. But we have manipulated the Word of God to suit ourselves. But tonight God will even show you because he wants to grant you an opportunity to be a servant. Only servants will inherit eternity. Servant today, joint heir tomorrow. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, not servants anymore. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be right now. And so the Bible is clear. In Luke 14, in Luke 14, the Bible says, For which of you, I'm actually asking you not to come back to any more of the meetings if you're not going to be serious about God. It's for your own safety. It will be better for you to go on and have fun. Get with your boyfriend who God told you to leave alone and just have a good time with him. Or get with your girlfriend who you won't break up with. Keep making excuses for fornicating and committing adultery. Go on and have fun. The Bible says it. That's what it says. In Ecclesiastes 11, it says, go on. Have a good time. Do whatever you want to do. But know this, that you must give an account in the judgment. But don't come here if you're not going to be serious. Because we're going into studies now that are for the true servants of God. The true servants of God. And so I'm warning you, because if you get this knowledge and you're playing with God, guess what? You're only going to multiply your damnation upon yourself. I want you to live. I want you to have life. So I don't want to give you something that's only going to put you in a worse condition. Because once you get this knowledge, you become a threat to the very roots of hell. You become a threat to the empire of Satan. I'm, not, I'm serious. So you have to make a decision right now. You need to count the cost of what you're going to say tonight. I'm about to ask who's on the Lord's side tonight. This isn't a buddy-buddy plan. God told Moses in chapter 34, say, hey, Moses, get up. Come on, you come alone. No buddy-buddy plan. You don't get to get together and look at each other and say, okay, are we going to follow God? No, it's an individual plan. If my wife chooses not to follow God, she will go to hell alone. And by the way, she'll tell you the same thing. She'll say, if my husband chooses to go against God, he will go to hell alone. And that's the way it should be. If my, I'm not going to be lost behind my children. You know how many people are going to be lost behind loving children who don't love God? Children who are enemies of the cross. And we spend time worrying about people who don't love Jesus. And we connect ourselves to them. And we, we ingratiate our own feelings into them. And they will cause us to be separated from God. That's why the Bible's clear. I love Jesus because he, you know what? He doesn't play games. Jesus is real. Jesus said, look, whoever is not with me is against me. Whoever loves father, mother, brother, or sister more than me is not worthy of me. If you're not willing to cut all that off, some of us have deeper feelings and deeper ties to humans than we do God. We think more about them. We care more about them. We cry more over them. And God says, that's your idol. That's your God. And so tonight, the Bible says very clearly, For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? 
lest happily after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king goeth to make goeth to make war against another king? Sitteth not down first, and consulteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand, or else while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and, and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh what, brothers and sisters? Not all, whoever you are tonight that is not willing to forsake all, he cannot be my disciple, period. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter your lineage. Doesn't matter how many times you've read the Bible. Doesn't matter what church you belong to. If you're not willing to give it all up, you cannot be God's, period. We're living in a day and hour where God needs a peculiar people. A people that will spread the true message that will bring the end upon this earth. A people who will not only preach it, but a people who will live it. A people whose light will shine. Tonight, the question is, who's on the Lord's side? Tonight, the question is, who are you yielding yourselves, servants, to obey? Who's your commander tonight? Who is it that you will give homage to? And peradventure, peradventure that we haven't gone too far already. In other words, hoping that even now, as I ask this question, hoping it's not already too late. Whose side will you stand on? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Who's on the Lord's side? Tonight, Who's on the Lord's side? The Bible says if God, if God be God, if God is who he says he is, then you need to serve him. And if you're not going to give God all your heart, then don't go to hell on a moped. Don't be lost. Enjoy this life. Go and have a good time. Fill up on all the joys that this earth can give you. But if you believe in God, and you believe that God is who he says he is, Tonight, you choose. You make the choice. Choose you this day, the Bible says, who you will serve. Choose right now. The line is drawn. Everybody who stays seated that can, that can stand up tonight, you choose against God. Those who choose God, stand to your feet right now. Don't just stand because you don't want people to know. Count the cost. Count the cost. Heads are still bowed, eyes are closed. Now talk to the Lord. Father, help me. Help me, Lord. 
I stood without any human power to keep me from falling. But tonight, Lord, I give you charge over my life. Tonight, I surrender. I surrender, Lord. I stand by you. Take my heart, Lord. I can't cut any deals. I can't promise what I will or will not do. But tonight, I give you my heart. Right now, I'm yours, Lord. Tell the Lord. Be honest. If there are sins in your life, Tell the Lord the truth. Help me, Lord. Help me to die to self. Help me, Lord. Help me. Our Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come before you. And Lord, we know that you have accepted us. Because the same power that Moses met on the mountain is in this room. And the same God that he worshiped has just sent angels to help us stand up. Demons would have kept you in your seat, but they didn't have the power. The gates of hell had no authority over you tonight. Unseen hands worked with your muscles and the movement of your joints and assisted you in standing for God. And the same angels that assisted you in standing said that right now they are able to keep you from falling. They are able to keep you standing and to present you faultless before Jesus. Heavenly Father, we believe. Help our unbelief. Wash us tonight. We thank you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you be seated for a moment of meditation?